Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Peter Goldmark, Commissioner of Public Lands for the state. The topic for today is forest biomass. Forest biomass is the byproduct of routine harvest and is largely composed of tree limbs, tops, and other waste woody material created during the processing of trees prior to hauling of the logs off-site. Until recently, biomass was usually piled in slash piles adjacent to roads where logs were loaded on trucks and burned on site to simply remove the waste. Biomass is not saw logs, roots, or other material dispersed across the landscape. Creating value from this forest biomass has been a major effort of mine since taking office in 2009. Over successive legislative sessions since that time, I have re received authorization from both the legislature and the governor to facilitate pilot projects with businesses to convert forest biomass to energy in different locations across the state. Modify DNR sales requirements of valuable materials to allow for long-term supply agreements. Also, to partner with both Washington State University and the University of Washington to conduct a pilot project to convert forest biomass to jet fuel. And finally, conduct a statewide supply study to determine the supply of commercially available forest biomass. To encourage commercial utilization of forest biomass while ensuring ecological health of the forest landscape, it is crucial to understand potential supply while studying biomass left on the landscape for forest health. To accomplish this, a grant was obtained from the U.S. Forest Service. The University of Washington was selected to conduct a forest biomass supply study statewide across the landscape and across all ownerships. This study commenced in the fall of 2010. Today, I am pleased to release the Washington Forest Biomass Supply Assessment. Its major conclusions are the following. Of the 4.4 million bone-dry tons of forest biomass produced by logging operations in 2010, 1.4 million dry tons, or roughly 30%, was potentially available as supply for commercial utilization. Only 30% of this available supply was actually used in 2010 leaving another 0.8 to 1 million bone dry tons available for additional utilization. So to recap those two numbers, 4.4 million dry tons out there across the landscape. Only one third was commercially available. And of that one third that was commercially available, only one third was actually utilized in 2010. This finding shows there is ample supply both for existing users of forest biomass and opportunity for additional commercial utilization. An additional finding is that sufficient biomass is left scattered on the landscape, both pre-existing and as a result of timber harvest, to ensure the ecological health of the forest floor. The study found that approximately 66% of the forest biomass produced during logging operations stayed on the landscape. This study demonstrates that there is ample supply of forest biomass to support expansion of Washington's bioenergy sector. This important sector can create needed green jobs, contribute to renewable to the state's renewable energy portfolio and provide new revenue for education and counties. This study is also a key link to ensure that Washington's forest bioenergy sector 
is based on sound science and sustainability principles. My thanks for their help in conducting this study go out to staff here at DNR, the US Forest Service for the grant and continuing partnering on this and many other projects, the, Washington, the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Resource Sciences, and TSS Consultants. So joining me here today is Peggy Policcio, who is Director of the State and Private Forestry for the U.S. Forest Service located in Portland, Oregon, in charge of both the Pacific Northwest and Alaska regions, and I've invited her here to make further comment. Peggy. Commissioner, thank you for this invitation to be here with you today. And it's been our privilege to have uh, shared with you uh, the investment in this study. And um, we're just thrilled about some of the um, recommendations and tools that have been created as a result of your efforts and vision and uh, those of the uh, entities uh, conducting this study. I'll just make a few remarks about how we, the Forest Service, intend to use uh, the results of this study. Um, first of all, we periodically make investments around the state and the region in bioenergy, um, either through competitive processes or just um, as a matter of program. And so we will be looking at this study carefully as uh, we decide where with our partners to make some of these bioenergy investments uh, for entrepreneurs and businesses. Uh, we also will distribute this information to all of the community-based forestry groups, collab collaboratives, communities, entrepreneurs, and others uh, who need this kind of data to help determine whether or not this is, uh, they can make some sound business decisions. Um, additionally, we will, of course, make this information and these tools available to all of the national forests in Washington state. Um, as one of the land stewards here in the state of Washington, uh, we, like many of you, are very interested in the business opportunities associated with uh, utilization of this kind of material while also providing for healthy forests. Uh, another use that we see is that um, other states are beginning to make studies similar to this, and we will be making your study available to, for example, the state of Oregon, the Department of Energy is initiating a study right now. And if, in fact, they can adopt some of your protocols, some of the findings, some of the tools that you all have created uh, through this process, we would hope to come up with more of a regional approach to looking at biomass and bioenergy in the Pacific Northwest. And finally, we will be sharing the Washington study nationally with the national forests throughout the country, other states. We have mechanisms to do that. I know that you all do as well. Uh, but we're really proud of this work, and uh, we will be sharing it so that others can, uh, again, look at the potentials for these products and uh, these tools um, throughout the country. So on behalf of the Forest Service, thank you, Commissioner, for having us here today. Thank you, Peggy. And next joining us is Bill Herman from Herman Brothers Logging. He has uh, considerable experience in the transport of biomass, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm Bill Herman, Herman Brothers Logging Company. We've been in business on the Olympic Peninsula for, oh, 43, 44 years now. So I guess I've been around for a while. And I have worked quite extensively in this, this uh, forest biomass uh, arena. About five years ago, one of the, or a couple, both of the paper mills on the Olympic Peninsula asked us if we could uh, help develop a process for being able to, to retrieve and, and uh, process and deliver forest biomass for fuel for their, their boiler systems. First of all, we had to really find out if it's why we would do this. Is it worth the trouble? And because mills have used hog fuel biomass for many, many years as, as their fuel source, usually burning waste from sawmills and so on, um, I really wanted to know what was the benefit. Were we just doing it as a political exercise or, or did it really have benefit? And in studying the heat value of biomass, found out that each truckload that you might see going down the road, a big box truck with a drop belly that's hauling um, uh, wood products, 
hauls enough biomass to be equal to 1,500 gallons of oil. And that can be varied a little bit by moisture content and such, but it's, it's a good average. So then I figured out, is this really dollar competitive to the oil that you would be equal to? And I'd come to find out, um, it's very competitive. It's much less expensive than oil is. And that's very important to our, our local mills because we have to be able to provide an energy source that they can afford to use that will keep them in business forever, or as long as they, there's a need for their, their products anyway. So we can't just keep letting uh, world oil prices drive their costs up and put us out of competition with the, with the rest of the world. So this, this is a, a very, very important piece of the, um, of the energy source that, uh, that I'm very happy to have been able to help uh, uh, do what we have so far in getting this as a viable product to market. One, one thing that um, was in the report is they're, they're now producing, or we're, we are retrieving about 600,000 bone dry tons across the state and taking them to market from forest biomass. And we uh, ourselves harvested about 10% of that. And that provided between 25 and 30 jobs. So that's a pretty important part to us too, that uh, we can keep a lot of folks working. And the commissioner mentioned that that was, 40, what was it, 4,200, 4, bone dry tons? No, it's more, more than that. Anyway, the number of bone dry tons was I'm losing my stock for a second here. Anyway, the number of bone dry tons uh, was so important and that we only harvested a third of them, um, put us in, in pretty good shape. I'm gonna stop for a second here. Uh, anyway, with uh, 600,000 bone dry tons, we produced about 10% of it, uh, got, got ourselves in, in a position to be able to develop new machinery uh, one of the things that has always been a, a problem is how to get that forest biomass from the top of those mountains where they're doing the logging down to the, to the uh, uh, mill sites. And so we actually invented new trailers and new trucks that can steer themselves and not cause extra road construction to be done so that we can actually facilitate getting that stuff off the hill. Uh, getting back to what I was trying to say a second ago, uh, we were very involved in the Washington State University's study <clears throat> through the Resource Source Center of the University of Washington study uh, out in Forks and that we actually did a lot of the measurements and the uh, uh, grinding up the piles and weighing them and, and double checking the numbers that the guys who were on the ground were measuring and, and coming up with their, their numbers. <clears throat> so to that, uh, I'm very, very confident that uh, the numbers are, are pretty darn close to, to accurate. There was, as I talked to a lot of the fellows who did the actual work on the ground and measuring, they went as far as to actually picking up sticks that long and measuring them, quantifying them, and, and uh, getting it so that uh, they weren't missing anything. It, it was a, a good study. So I'm very happy to do that. I've been uh, very happy to help start in this, this new industry, and it's, um, going to be a pretty important part of the resources to, to keep this forest industry viable, keep the forest uh, continuing to be, have the best stewardship practiced, because instead of just burning that resource and letting it go to, to smoke, we're going to get some benefit out of it along the way and leave enough for the critters too. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for reminding us all that this is a renewable resource that we're talking about here. This isn't something that we're going to use up in one year. It's going to be replenished on an annual basis. So with that, um, we're here uh, for press availability, and we're happy to take any questions. Bob, do you have any questions? No, no, no. Bill, if I could have you just describe a little more what kind of contracts you have. Is this cleaning up after logging, or is this thinning, or you're doing 
first saw logs and then going back and the same comp bid that you Well, we've been in the logging business for a long time, yeah. and so we do log as well as, as pick up biomass. Okay. But uh, the biomass and the logging are not connected. Okay. They're two separate operations. Uh, logging of a site, say 30 or 40 acres, may take 30 or 40 days. So you do not do the biomass harvest uh, along with the logging because the, the, the biomass picking up the, the residual piles along the roadsides and such may only take anywhere from two to seven or eight days. Okay, and are so you it, chipping it on site? We do chip it on site. On site. And then you right, take it to site. Simpson and... Uh, whoever the customer may be. Okay. Yes. But on the peninsula? Uh, yes. Okay. That was one of the reasons we got started because we were actually having to pick up residuals mm -hmm. on the I-5 corridor and haul them back to the peninsula. Mm -hmm. So we needed some more okay. uh, material, so that was why, why we started. And just to clarify, you're not doing specific thinning contracts for forest fire or anything on the peninsula? The peninsula is, the forests are such there that we don't do that for forest fire reduction purposes. We do it for silvicultural forest health reasons and uh, and better productivity of the stands. Okay. So that that's and why that's part of part of your con existing contracts. If the brushes and uh, limbs and such are brought to roadside during that operation, then that's what we would go back and pick up is the brush from that. Yes. And then just to follow up for Commissioner Goldmark, so do you anticipate the increased supply coming off more activities like was just described, or is there some other category that would generate a lot of this additional surplus biomass? Actually, there's, there's tremendous opportunity across the landscape, and that's what the supply study demonstrates. There's opportunity here in western Washington, there's opportunity out on the peninsula, and importantly, there's opportunity in eastern Washington around forest health issues that, uh, that are a big concern of mine. We've got a lot of uh, dead and dying material over there, overstocked stands, huge fire risk uh, because of that, and there, a lot of the material is not suitable as saw logs, and so biomass is one potential um, outcome for this material, and knowing where it is, being able to describe where it is, and then retrieve it is part of my ongoing process. I'm working with the legislature, uh, trying to achieve capital funding for that, also carrying on a technical advisory committee to help decide where to get started on the, the forest health issues in eastern Washington. So the two-thirds of the biomass that's not captured now, would most of it be captured through thinning operations or just surplus stuff that's lying it's around It's from now. all of those resources. Yeah. There's a lot of it that's going unutilized, existing piles that are either left to rot or that are burned to no use, and then a lot, of more, a lot more available supply in eastern Washington that will result from these forest health improvement operations. Thank you. Oh, I have a, question, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, Bellamy, this is for uh, Peggy. Uh, Bellamy uh, Hale Thorpe of KPLU uh, is asking, um, how does this fit in with recent changes to uh, policy of management of national forests? And if you could please repeat the question just in case my voice is not coming across Twitter. Okay. Um, I think what I heard you say is, how does this relate to recent policy changes in forest? National forest management. National forest management. How interesting. Well, for a very long time, uh, we've been at the Forest Service have uh, had the shared interest with what the commissioner describes: forest health, ecological, ecologically sound forest health, uh, utilization of material that um, we, we'd much rather see product uh, uh, come from and, and businesses uh, and prosperity uh, uh, with use of this this material. Uh, rather than uh, having it go up in smoke, as, as Bill talked about. So I'm not sure which recent policies uh, this individual is talking to, but this is consistent with our uh, uh, management objectives for the National Forests. Okay. And then uh, we have another question, perhaps, for uh, Commissioner Goldmark. It's from Amelia Templeton of uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting, who was asking, um, have you made any effort to calculate the carbon footprint of increasing forest biomass production and use in Washington. Uh, and she cites a recent OSU study suggesting that thinning for biomass is not carbon neutral. So we, we have not done the carbon uh, equation, but I think it's very important uh, to understand 
that forest bi most of the forest biomass that will potentially be utilized through this process is material that would otherwise release carbon into the atmosphere anyway, to no good purpose. So if we can in instead utilize that in a productive manner, for instance, to, to generate heat, or more importantly, to generate jet fuel, then we can get something good. We can get jobs, we can get revenue, while we're re releasing the carbon dioxide. So this is a way to put the material to good use. And uh, Eric Olson of the uh, Daily News, the uh, Longview Daily News, um, uh, is asking, uh, does Commissioner Goldmark expect this study will spur new biomass facility developments, or will most of the biomass go to existing facilities? So in response to the question about, do I think that this biomass study will spur new industrial utilization or will it all go to existing uses? I think it will do both. We have, we um, here at DNR and the state have been uh, waiting until this supply study has come forward until we could make commitments about available supply. Before this study, we didn't know what was available sustainably. Now we do. We have a science-based study that tells us spatially across the landscape where available supply is. Knowing that, then we can work with potential industrial um, users to help them cite any, uh, any businesses according to where the available supply is. So this will be a great boon for potential uh, commercial businesses and also a boon to existing users. They will know across the landscape where the supply is located. That's all we have right now. Can you speak a little more about the economics? Because there have been, and I'm thinking of a company that was going to locate or maybe still wants to in Shelton. It was a Duke Energy, possibly co production, but they've decided the economics aren't there yet. And has something changed lately, or is the economic issue of making this pay, particularly hauling the product out of the woods, still an issue for further expansion? So um, I think you're, you're speaking of a plant that was potentially out at Shelton yeah. that was going to consume um, huge quantities of biomass. And there was an open question as to whether there was uh, enough existing supply to meet the needs. And this study, um, and I'm not sure how this study informs that particular decision or not, but that was contemplating using, I think, in excess of 500,000 bone dry tons per year. And so if you think in the context of this particular study, you understand that um, just a little over a million tons uh, is available. So that would have consumed a lot of the statewide availability. And, and I would just suggest that in light of the fact that a tremendous amount of the cost of biomass is the actual transportation from the forest site down to the, uh, the plant, if you will, where it's to be utilized, it becomes ec uneconomic outside a 40 or 50 mile radius. So I think, again, this supply study will be very useful for commercial enterprises contemplating uh, operating in the state of Washington. We'll be able to, to really dial up their own business economics and figure out if it'll work or not. Would you put the biomass from a timber sale out to bid separately from the saw logs if, uh, going forward? So Bill was pretty good about describing that. During normal forestry operations, um, logs are, I'm sorry, trees are harvested in the woods and they're felled. And where they're felled, then they're usually cabled up to a landing. So they arrive at the landing with limbs and tops attached. That's the potential biomass. I mean, the uh, processing equipment at the landing removes all that material before the log is loaded onto the truck. So those piles of slash are what are potentially available for bio, for forest biomass. And that, right now, the ownership of that slash goes to whoever bid on the timber sale. Well, right. it depends or, on exactly the kind of timber sale that occurred. Okay, talk about in, the In, in, uh, in some cases, and, and we're reviewing this, mm -hmm. where we sell a, uh, basically logs at the stump, then the forest biomass is potentially available unless we change our contracts to the uh, purchaser of the lump sum sale. However, uh, up to about 20% of our sales are conducted through contract harvesting, where we, DNR, actually go out and contract for the forestry operations that result in delivery of logs 
two mills, meaning we make all the decisions and um, we get all the material from that. So there's a difference there. But in addition, obviously private landowners can form whatever agreements they choose to form with logging operations to, if they choose, retain the biomass in their ownership or if they choose, have it go with the with the logging operation. And does the study compel any changes to your approach? Well, I think, I think the study informs both landowners and loggers about choices that they might make. Um, obviously, as biomass becomes more avail available uh, and more uh, expensive, if you will, it's quite cheap at the landing now, but if we're able to partner with the University of Washington and WSU, as we're hoping to, and can actually convert some of this material to jet fuel, um, I'm convinced that the price of it at the landing will increase, the return to the landowner will increase, because the value that um, Mr. Herman talked about, the 1,500 gallons per truckload going down the 1,500 gallons, if we can actually convert that into jet fuel, that will improve the price at the landing. And I think that'll drive the process much quicker and potentially start to capture more of the available material. All right. Thank you. Thank you all.